when I was at the academy as an instructor, uh, the firefighters that showed up fit proved to me on day one how bad they wanted this job. They proved to me that they have the discipline. They have the ability to do things they don't want to do because not everybody wants to work out every day. There's a guys welcome back tailboard misfits podcast today i have an honor the honor and privilege of talking with john sparrow he's a 23 year tailboard fireman and that's about all he would give me on the bio so i think that says a lot about him uh to, uh, i've been looking forward to this uh since since we connected and i've been trying to scheme up a good conversation because i know you do a lot of these and you have a lot to share and uh i can't think of a, another person in the fire service that has probably influenced more people than you and uh, really fit to fight fire. Cause I know it's not just a one man show. Um, but other than that, John, how's it going? Hey man, first of all, thank you for having me on and uh, fit to fight fire is a community. What's so cool about it is we're a group of like-minded firefighters all on the same mission, right? To be the best version of ourselves. And um, that's really what it is. I don't, I don't, I'm not real comfortable with, it being a person, uh, that was never the goal. I know that's hard to get away from. I, I do my best to do that. But the reality of it is, is it's thousands of firefighters that just connect to the message. And the message is, you know, we want to show up as the best version of ourselves. We believe our level of fitness and training will make the difference between life and death for others. And uh, having a like-minded group of people, and they hold me accountable as much as the message holds them accountable, which is what I really appreciate appreciate about the the community. But man. Uh, I am so grateful for the opportunity to talk to you. I love what you're doing. I've li listened to several of your episodes. Uh, just really looking forward to getting into it today. That means a lot because I, uh, we, we were just talking and this is really, it really is out of my comfort zone. And I, I like to put out the best content that I can. Like if I'm going to do something, I want to do it to the best I can. And for, for you to say that you listen to this, that's, it's, uh, as weird as it is to say, it's almost a fangirl moment, if you will. Um, but the fit to fight fire, like, um, I've heard about it before I ever became what I would consider plugged in. So that's the reach that it has, right? Before I knew what the scrap was, before I knew what conferences were, I knew what fit to fight fire was. Uh, did I know it to the level that I know now? No, I didn't. Uh, and actually I am proud to say I didn't do it because you were coming on, on the podcast. I had a buddy that was like pushing this. I'm I'm now a subscriber, a member of the Fit to Fight Fire thing. I think I did it like two or three days ago. I saw that, man. I appreciate you jumping on board. That's pretty cool. Hopefully, we're adding value to people's lives. My, what I love most about it is, yeah, we give you a workout of the day, um, and we give you a scaled version of that too. But what I love most about it is the um, messages I get from the community and having opportunities to jump on the phone with somebody, which is rare today. We don't really get a chance to do that, but if somebody has something that they want to talk about, or I could share a past experience that I went through that I think could help them out, that is my favorite part of that community is those phone calls. And um, and I learn a lot from them as well as as we go through those conversations. So that's cool, man. I'm I'm really excited for you to be part of that, that community. That's awesome. Well, we're going to kind of get into it, but just uh, to highlight the, the whole Patreon app and like what you're doing there is... Um, I've never messed with that app before or anything like that. And the moment I went into it, I just dove into it and I'll give him a shout out. My friend, Michael Ramirez, I think he's been a subscriber of yours for a while. And he was the one that was pushing me. Yeah, because... I know Michael. Michael's okay. awesome, man. He's a, he's into the job. I love, I love what he shares. And um, at times I'll look at hit what he's doing for the day. I'll be like, all right, man, I need to, <laughs> I need to get into it. I need to get downstairs and get a workout in. So that's what I love about it. As you look out yeah. into the world, as bad as social media can be sometimes, um, if you use it for good and you use it to inspire other people, it's, it's, it's great. And I, I lean on guys like Michael and, and guys that are part of that community uh, to hold me accountable too, because let's face it, when you share a message of it's important to show up fit, it's important to show up prepared and you don't hold yourself accountable to that, man, that's, you lose all credibility. So as much as that message is resonating with others, I'm looking into those other people out there for that same, that same inspiration. So. Shout out to Michael Ramirez. Yeah, that says a lot about you too, what you just said. And what I was going to say was like uh, a lot of programs for, and I'm speaking from a personal standpoint because I'm not the fittest person in the world. Uh, I wouldn't consider myself like completely out of shape or anything, but the, the, the functional fitness side of things is a little uncomfortable to me. 
I'm the typical football player that did the bro splits for the, you know, primarily all of his life. And, uh, I, within the last couple of years, got into running and starting to get into the functional side. And I just, sometimes the it's, it's intimidating is what I'm trying to say. And when I got on there, I was like, Oh, that's, you know, that's not super intimidating. It's very doable. Um, and then like the, the, the vitamins for the mind. I love that. I love those posts too. And I've only seen a couple of them so far. Uh, but the purpose behind fit to fight fire, where did it come from? What were you hoping to do? And have you accomplished that yet? Yeah. So when I first got into the fire service, this is going to be my, um, my 23rd year. And, uh, as a teenager, I was always looking at the military and that was something I wanted to do. Unfortunately, uh, I got out of high school at 17. My parents didn't support that dream. They had a lot of influence in my life. Um, I was looking at the spec ops community. That was something I wanted to do as a teenager. Uh, parents weren't on board and it's really interesting because they're so patriotic and they love our country, but they didn't want their own son to, uh, enlist in the military. And it was, uh, it was tough because I really did value their opinion. But through that te those teenage years, I always looked to that community and, and saw the way they handled their business. And I felt like they had that warrior mentality, that warrior spirit. They were fit mentally, physically, spiritually, read those books as a teenager, uh, got into college for exercise science. One day my dad came to me and he said, hey, you're not doing great in school. You're, you love to work out. And I worked out since I was 12 years old. You know, I was the kid that was the smallest, the lightest, and I had to work the hardest to make the team. So even as a 12 year old, I would be running, uh, try to get my run in before the street lights would come on so that I didn't get in trouble. I had to be home before the street lights. So I was doing things like that early on. And I saw that if I worked hard, um, that I earned a place in the world. Uh, and as a smaller guy, that was all you really wanted, right? Because you didn't get picked first unless you prove that you should be picked first. And I remember I got picked last one time in my life. It was one time. And that was enough to be like, no more. That's not going to happen again. I might not be the fastest. I might not be the strongest. I might not be the biggest. But I know that I could outwork these other kids. With that being said, get out of high school. The physical side of things really interested me. So I went to college for exercise science. But I was never a good student, dude. I got enough grades to play sports. That was what I did. And uh, even in college, I struggled. And my dad came to me one day. He's like, what do you think about being a firefighter? And for as much as I love the military and I love physical fitness, that was never on my radar. But the moment he said that, it like clicked. I'm like, of course. Why would I not use my passion for physical fitness to serve other people? It just made sense in that moment. And I was so grateful that my dad, saw that in me. And I never saw that in myself or saw that for myself. And with that being said, I started in South Florida with Boca Raton Fire Rescue was my first department. But in South Florida, you had to put yourself through EMT school. You had to put yourself through paramedic school and you had to put yourself through the fire academy before you could actually apply to department. So you're looking at like three years. My dad came to me. I was probably at that time, 20 years old and um, started doing that. I sold mountain bikes. I sold my road bike. I sold gym equipment, the stuff that I loved to pay for this because I was already on my own, living on my own. And I got through the fire academy. I loved the fire academy. I loved the physical side, the classroom stuff, really. It was ifs to stuff. And even back then, I was like, man, this is dry. Like this, no one was talking about what they talk about at the conferences nowadays, right? It was just mm -hmm. textbook information. I was like, I just want to go outside and do work. And when we did that, I just felt whole. I felt like this is where I was supposed to be. Now, in the fire academy, you get an example of a couple of instructors that are dialed in, they're fit, and they inspire you. You always have that couple that are out of shape, and they're still yelling at you. You know, that's just the way it is. But I at least had that group that I could look to of instructors, and all of us were working hard. So that was the only thing I knew about the fire service until I got into the fire department. And I was disappointed, man. I didn't expect there to be people that didn't take the job serious. I didn't expect there to be people that didn't see the mission of the fire service of protecting life. Uh, I think there were just people that just weren't on board with that. It was frustrating. Of course, you're on probation. It's your first year. All you want to do is belong. So I really didn't voice that opinion, right? I didn't share that as a brand new firefighter, but it was inside me. And the people that I trusted that did see the fire service for what it was, I had those conversations with them. And through all the books I've read in the past and the books I continue to read as I got into the fire service that were just leadership books and things of that nature, I just began to have conversations with other like-minded firefighters within my fire department. 
And that's where Fit to Fight Fire was born from. It was born from frustration of seeing a fire service that I thought didn't exist, where there was complacency, there were lazy people, there were out of shape firefighters, there were firefighters that were on for 10 years that were terrible at their skill set. And it just caused me to begin to share a message that I hope would inspire other firefighters to become the best version of themselves. And you talked about it earlier. You said you like the vitamins for the mind. I believe our inputs, the things that we read, listen to, watch on television, those are our inputs. They're going to create our output. And we could be very intentional on what we allow to come inside of our mind, as well as our bodies when it comes to food. And if I'm real intentional on my inputs, my output's going to most likely be positive. If I let the world determine what my inputs are going to be, the things that they're throwing at us on a daily basis, I'm not going to really have control as much as I'd like to think on how I see the world. So Vitamins for the Mind is really what Fit to Fight Fire was from the beginning and continues to be. It's a place where firefighters could go to get inspired or to confirm what they're already doing to become the best version of themselves. So hopefully that's what we're doing. Um, I don't know that there's ever a finish line to this thing. It's really uh, just an ongoing process of trying to get better myself, sharing my struggles, and then sharing the things that I connect with to inspire me. It's really what it's about. It's the community. It's all about that community and uh, you know, all of us working to get better on a daily basis. Yeah, you said a couple things and just want to go back to it because I think it's crazy that even if we're not talking about something super traumatic, as you referenced not getting picked or you, you getting picked last when you were a child, right? And that kind of shape what you ended up becoming and who you are today, right? And I could think of some times in my life the same thing, right? There was a certain point in my childhood where something happened to me that kind of shaped who I am and what I've become to this day and oftentimes still uh, reference that. So I thought that was kind of, uh, you know, intriguing for me. And then, like you said, the, the influence thing. And I have a good group of friends that I talk to from all over the country. One of them's from your neck of the woods, uh, Preston Lyons. And he was telling me just how, uh, how much he appreciated your guidance and wisdom and uh, so everything you want to do, like you're accomplishing, and I know that you know that, but I also know that uh, people need and, and like to hear that affirmation that it is, that it is working and uh, that you guys are fulfilling like what you have been called to do. And I, I think that's pretty evident. But the other part of that is uh, your age, right? Like you, you, you're big on that, not because you're an old guy or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that, but you said you were 48. Yeah, I turned. Uh... I'll be 49 in July. So, yep, I'm 48 years old. And I just want to circle back to one thing you said when you talked about you could look back on your own life and see areas of your own life that were kind of like turning points. And you get to make a choice, right? Am I going to be the guy who gets picked last for the rest of my life? Or am I going to do something different? Am I going to make a decision? Right? I knew I wasn't going to get taller. My speed was kind of determined. Yeah, you could work on that. My strength I could work on. But what I could definitely do is I could outwork everybody. There was nobody mm. that was in com my complete control. And what that goes back to, everybody that's listening to this episode, at our core, firefighters, as human beings, we want to feel like we're good enough. That's what we want to feel. Every one of us wants to know we're good enough. So if you have an opportunity to tell somebody that, tell them. Right. And if you believe that about them, like, don't hold that away for them. Let them know, because that's what you're doing. Everybody, every one of us is on a path of just making sure we have what it takes. The most basic human desire is to know we have what it takes to do whatever it is we're pursuing. So that's what I was was pursuing as a kid. And I found my place in work and, and trying to outwork everybody and hustle and, and not quit and all that stuff. And it just was real simple. If I just kept applying that throughout my life, um, I had success. And going back to what you said, talking to Preston, I had a great conversation with him. And that's the cool thing about this is in that conversation, I learned things from him as well. So yeah, man, that's what it's about. It's about all of us understanding. We all, none of us wake up in the morning. We're like, Hey man, I just want to suck today. Mm. I just want to be the worst firefighter. I hope I make a lot of mistakes. Sometimes we get on these different paths and we're just not doing the things we're supposed to do. But at the core of each individual, they just want to know that they have what it takes. Yeah, I, I agree because that's, I relate to that so much and I'll try not to go on a rant about that. But like uh, you said you, at the beginning of this, you said a lot because, and I definitely 
understand and know. I, I'm a big John Maxwell fan. I, I love John Maxwell. Uh, all of his leadership principles are practically biblically based. And, um, you know, I, I've said it before on my podcast, like my daily devotional is a Maxwell leadership devotional. I, I love it. And um, he says the same thing that you're talking about, like what we put into our body uh, is what we get out of our body. And not just when I'm talking about nutrition, uh, fitness or whatever, but also like what you're listening to, what you're reading, uh, stuff like that. And so getting another um, avenue of something wholesome to read is always good because uh, we're so influenced by things online, social media, right? Like the algorithms are messed up and this, that, and another, like, trying just to have that constant feed of wholesomeness is what I strive to have. And, you know, it's, it's like I said, it's just nice to have another, another avenue for that through the, through the app and through what you guys are doing. So. And I kind of jumped away from your initial question. It was, a, I don't know if I was avoiding the question cause I didn't want to <laughs> admit that I was 48, but you know, age is a number and we say age is a number. And I'll tell you, there are some things that are different today at 48 than when I first started 23 years ago. But I, I really believe this. I believe this to my core. Like our fitness is the foundation of our preparation. Uh, when I was at the when I was at the academy as an instructor, uh, the firefighters that showed up fit proved to me on day one how bad they wanted this job. They proved to me that they have the discipline. They have the ability to do things they don't want to do because not everybody wants to work out every day. There's a lot of things that you show somebody when you show up physically fit. And you talked about the functional fitness a little bit earlier and how you're kind of making your way into that. And I love that concept of doing movements and doing work that transfers over to the fire ground. And I know you had Marcos on not too long ago and he mm -hmm. talked about this as well. Marcos talked about, you know, we're, we're working, we're training for performance. And if you train for performance, appearance will follow. You'll have good body composition. You'll have good health. You may not be a bodybuilder, you know, you may not be that, but you'll have overall good body composition. The problem is, is if you train for appearance, you're not guaranteed performance. So we tell people like train for performance, try to find movements and do things that will transfer over to the fire ground. So that's basically push and pull. Push and pull is what we do on the fire ground with our legs, with our upper body. And then we work two different energy systems, the aerobic and the anaerobic that we know. So we need to be physically fit to do our job that I understood from day one. So that's been the easy part for me. I'd be lying today to say that I don't enjoy working out. I had a conversation not too long ago with a chief who was trying to get in shape. He wanted me to give him an exercise program. And before I even had a chance to start talking to him, he looked at me, kind of pointed at my chest. Good dude. He's a friend of mine. He said, you need to understand something. Exercise is your hobby. I hate exercising. That was kind of like a transition from believing that everyone should be physically fit. Anybody who becomes a firefighter should want to work out. And that's just not reality, right? It's not mm -hmm. the way it is in the fire service. That's why we have a 70% overweight fire service. That's the truth. That's reality. Those are real numbers. So my ability to consistently train throughout my career was connecting to that responsibility and deeply understanding what it takes to serve at a level that I want somebody showing up to my own home. So it's not, I'm not saying that every day it's easy. I got the wind at my back and I'm running downhill. There are days where I have to look myself in the mirror and be like, hey, dude, are you really being who you say you are? Are you really being who you want to show up to your home? And there are days where it's, I'm not. So then I have a choice to make. Am I going to go and confirm that message that I'm sharing or that those words that I speak and actually do the work? Or am I going to be a fraud for the day? And there were days where I was. It's not every day that I actually hold up my end of the deal. There are days where things, you know, get in the way, the day gets away. It is what it is. But consistency to me is the most important thing. And consistency is what's allowed me to stay fit over my career. And I'll continue to do that at 48, 49, 50, God willing, as long as he wants me to be doing this job. And I'd much rather see somebody who's consistently good than see somebody who's occasionally great. Right. You get in the gym and you smoke it for two weeks and then you don't get back in there for six months. It's that consistency on a daily basis of getting in there, making sure you do the work that's necessary to do the job at the level you said you would do it. So, yeah, man, there, there are times where I'll wake up after a day of training. Like some days I'll and this is a question I get a lot. It's like, how many workouts do you do a week? And I don't look at 
or how many days do you work out per week? And I don't look at days as much as actual workouts. Mm. So how many workouts can I get in a week? And if I'm at a station, um, we work 48, 96. So if I'm there for 48 hours, I'm going to try to at least get four. Uh, it's not always possible, but I'm gonna try to get four because those four workouts are four less workouts I need to do when I'm with my family, right? I'm at the job. I'm supposed to be working out and training anyway. I'm going to try and get those in, but I'm not going to lie, man. There are days where you get, you know, a 48 hour shift. I, maybe I got five in. maybe I got really after it, that, that shift. And that next day off is I'm, I'm sore, man. I'm 48 years old. Like it is what it is. I eat right. I take cold plunges. I sleep good. I barely drink. Like I do all the things that I should be doing, but at the end of the day, I'm still 48 years old, but I don't allow that to be an excuse not to get back after it the day after or the day after that. So it's consistency and connecting to who I said I would be. That's really what it came, comes down to. Yeah. And so I, I would ask for your advice because I had this conversation with a friend um, yesterday and it's just like, I am a, and I think a lot of people are, that's why I'm asking this is, I think a lot of people are very goal oriented when it comes to their physical fitness. They want to go run a marathon. They want to perform in a CrossFit competition, right? And then once, and I 100% can relate right here, um, once they hit that goal, once they do it, now it's just like, now what? And if they don't effectively set another goal, they tend to taper away or taper back down. So uh, I don't necessarily know if you could uh, develop consistency rather than just Im implementing discipline. But if you had any like tips, tricks to, to say to that uh, goal, goal oriented person. Well, I would say this to the goal oriented person. What if your goal was to be the, be the firefighter you want showing up to your own home and to get to that goal? There's no finish line, right? So what if it's a goal where my, my goal is to be the firefighter, the type of firefighter I'd want getting off the rig grabbing a ladder and hustling to the Charlie side to throw that ladder to the second floor window of my children's bedroom. You know, to be able to do that, you have to be physically fit, right? You have to be physically fit. You have to be able to do that in your gear. You have to be able to do that at a pace that is going to get you inside that window, maybe 60, sec 60 seconds faster than somebody who's not in shape. What if your only goal was to be that firefighter, career longevity and durability? That's to me, that's enough. Like I get that you might need to run a 5k and you might need to train for the smoke diver program, or you might need to do an ultra marathon, throw that in there. But the ultimate goal is you're a firefighter. That's mm. your job. You're not a 5k runner. You're not a professional ultra marathon runner. You're not a triathlete. You're a firefighter. So your main goal should be the bet to be the best firefighter you could be. And for me, I always have to have a vision of that type of firefighter. I want showing up to my home. That's what I I'm always striving for. I hope I never get there. I hope it's a constant pursuit of getting in the gym, getting in the bay, going on the drill ground, reevaluating myself and continuing to do that over my career. So I totally get the goal. I think those are important to put in there, but the mm. ultimate goal should be the firefighter you want showing up to your, to your own home for your family. And in my opinion, fitness is the foundation of that. Yeah. I, that was a really good point. And not saying that I've never thought of that before, but just like I said, me being a goal oriented person, I do, it's hard to picture that. I feel like that's an end result for me. It's a goal. I get, I get what you're saying. And I'd really do like that. And I, I was writing it down just a second ago, but, uh, I, I think that a lot of people can benefit from that just because like I said, I think everyone is goal oriented. And I know several people, myself included, that they set, um, I said like outside factors, like the, the 5Ks or whatever as their goals and to be able to shift that to, to really focus on the job. I think that's important. And that's, so. and that's, that's not just fitness, right? So fitness is what we were just covering. So that's your fitness, your mindset, your skill set. And Chris Brennan, who wrote the book Fire Service Warrior, phenomenal book ahead of its time, in there says your fitness, your mindset, and your skill set will determine your work capacity. Your work capacity could determine somebody's life expectancy. Make sure your shit adds up, right? Your mm. fitness, your mindset, and your skill set determines your work capacity. Your work capacity will determine somebody's life expectancy. Make sure your shit adds up. So for me, if I could work on those three things as my goal throughout my whole career, 
then I should have no reason not to be able to connect to that oath and that ability to get over all my excuses. And it's really what it comes down to, right, man? It's the excuses. The excuses are trying to win out every single day. And you have to connect to something that's stronger than the excuses or you don't have a chance. It's just too easy to take the path of least resistance. Yeah. The um, uh, Joshua Chase, I know you're going to end up doing something with him at firemanship, I believe, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll uh, be doing a, um, a live podcast to kind of share his incredible story. Which is awesome. But in in one of, in one of his books, he talks about, uh, it says like, there's a, there's an excuse maker inside of all of us and it's our job to shut him up. And I was like, highlight, highlight, because yeah. that's me, you know, I'm, I'm overcoming a bunch of stuff as, as I talk through this. But stuff. understand this, man, like it's really easy to beat yourself up over that. Like every excuse that wins, you start to kind of feel like a failure, right? Every mm-hmm. excuse that wins and they stack up all day long. So by the end of the day, you're like, man, I feel like I, I, I just don't feel good. It's because you let every excuse win throughout the day. They stacked up, but the same thing could happen if you overcome every excuse throughout the day that stacks up too. And by the end of the day, you're like, I'm crushing it. I feel good. Now don't feel bad when the excuses win because you're wired that way. Our bodies are designed to take the path of least resistance. Our bodies are designed. It's evolutionary. Our bodies are designed to seek warmth, to find food, to find comfort. Like you are engineered that way. So it's going to be real easy when those opportunities to find warmth and comfort and all those things we want come up to be like, oh yeah, that's my body's telling me to go there. So yeah. it's having a really deep understanding like that's normal for the excuses to show up. Now it's up to you to connect to a purpose that's stronger those, than those excuses. And it goes back to what we talked about, like be that firefighter that you'd want coming to your own home. Envision yeah, I know, that. I know a lot of people use that coin right like would you want you rescuing you that's fit to fight fire and a lot of instructors use it um in their in their uh classes and everything like that but there's a reason for that because there's something there right and i i I would just be curious like i did you guys make that up like is that something that you guys coined because obviously from at this point uh it's been around for so long that that you guys have it but i was just curious about that yeah, man. So that was something I thought of. And there's, I, I think it's funny. Like a lot of people think fit to fight fire is like this group of people. It's just me, mm. me in the community that I'm the only one um, there was, a, there was a time where we had other people involved, Okay, but it is, it is just me. It's really like we talked about it's the community, but I'm the one kind of running, running the program. And um, that was something that I thought of as I was looking in the mirror and having those conversations of, Hey dude, are you who you say you are? And when I say mirror, it's not always a mirror. It could be sitting on the couch, right? It could be reading a book, but it's just figurative, figuratively looking in the mirror. And it's like, would you want you rescuing you right now? You haven't done anything today. You've done zero. If anything, you probably uh, shouldn't even be a firefighter. And that's how hard I am on myself. So sometimes people hear the fit to fight fire message and they're like, man, that's abrasive. That's, that's harsh. If you could only hear how I talk to myself, Right. If what I say offends you, you should hear how I talk to myself. And I mean that, man, that's part of this whole fit to fight fire thing is I am. These are conversations I have with myself. So, yeah, that was something that was just me having a conversation with myself. And uh, I I don't necessarily say that all the time to myself, but it's that idea. And here's another way to put it, too. Let's say you're in a room with 30 firefighters. Right. And you guys are getting ready for the class to start. You're all into the job and uh, dialed in firefighters. When you look in that room to include yourself, would you pick yourself to be the one that gets off the rig, grabs the ladder, throws it to the Charlie side, and goes in the window to get your kids? Some days I could say yes. Some days no, right? So that's the, that's the truth about this. There is never a finish line to this. The minute you think you arrived on your fitness, your mindset, and your skill set, you're starting to go backwards because you're not on that path of continuous growth. So yeah, it was a it was a conversation I had with myself, and it's something that I think uh, is just a a good question to every now and then ask ourselves, especially those days where the excuses are strong. Man, those mm-hmm. are the days where you really have to tap into something. It may not be that phrase, but it has to be something that you can I connect think, to. I think the phrase it does it enough, and the, what you went deeper in, right? The room full of firemen. That's even more because that's uh, you know if you're in a room and you're the smartest or the strongest or the fastest or whatever. You probably should be looking for a different room anyway. So yeah, um, I, uh, I wanted to circle back to something because you mentioned um, 
as you were coming up through the fire service, you said you're about two to three year guy and you didn't really want to voice your opinion at that moment, but you had all these feelings uh, just about the way stuff was being done and people not necessarily caring. And I feel like that message probably reigns home to a lot of uh, less tenured firemen nowadays. Uh, how, how did you mitigate that? Like th did the people around you help that? Uh, did you find some uh, healthy outlets that way you weren't coined like this, you know, terrible person that liked to run his mouth a lot? Yeah. So I, I barely, I barely spoke. And I think that was important because when you barely speak and as you begin to build credibility, when you do speak, people listen. Um, if all you're doing is talking all the time, especially as a new guy, and you really haven't established yourself with your work ethic and being somebody that could be dependable, it really doesn't have a lot of credibility. Now, the one thing when you don't have a voice early on, and that's normal, right? That's normal. And I think that's a good thing. You do actually have a voice and it's your actions. Your voice is your actions. So if I don't agree with what's going on around me in the firehouse, if people aren't working out, I'm working out. If I don't agree with the level of training that's going on in the firehouse, I'm out in the bay and I'm finding something. I'm going over the rig pack. I'm pretending to force a door because we don't have a forcible entry prop maybe in that station. I'll walk up to the door and I'll go through my steps. I'll pull the saw off the rig and I'll go through my cut sequence on the bay floor. So I was talking, but it wasn't with words. It was with, it was with my actions. Mm -hmm. My actions were combating the things I didn't believe in. And over time, those actions built credibility. And over time, I began to be able to have a voice. And I think that's the part a lot of people skip nowadays, especially within today's world where there's so, so much information and we could so easily share our ideas. Think about it. If you are a brand new firefighter and you're so comfortable with social media and voicing your opinion up until the point when you become a fire, you haven't become a firefighter yet, but your only life you know is like, hey, I get to share how I feel. At any moment, I could share how I feel with the world. And now you get into this fire department and that's not what people want. It's the truth, right? We no, Nobody wants to hear somebody who has everything to say and not much to do. Hmm. So you get in there and you start, you talk, you talk, you talk, but you really haven't done anything yet. I would encourage people who are in that spot where they don't agree with how things are going, who are newer to their organization, try to minimize the talk and try to increase the work. Minimize the talk, increase the work. Increase the work at a level that's undeniable. Don't do it to show off. Don't do it. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Work out, train, go over the rig, go through your SOPs, read a book, take a class. People are going to notice. And then once you earn that credibility and that influence, begin to share in a way that's not abrasive, that's encouraging, inspiring, lift people up. I think that's a perfect formula to handle those difficult situations. Problem is everybody skips the work and they go right to the words and then they wonder why no one's taking them serious. That's yeah, I couldn't agree more and uh, walk through a little bit of that myself. And, you know, something that I had to learn uh, early on is like, it, it's okay to, to train by yourself. There's so many things like you said that you can do by yourself. It doesn't have to be very elaborate to, to show that work. Um, and then I, I wanted to get into like the, the whole standards conversation because this is something that uh, at the time is a little like introspective, if you will, but you, you were at a department for 18 years and, and you left and started all over. Now, granted, I know that you're, you're, you're a tailboard fireman and uh, from some of the other podcasts I've listened to, I don't think you plan on promoting. Uh, so it wasn't like you were starting over from an officer standpoint back down to a tailboard, but what did that look like? And like, what, what led to that situation and that, that um, decision that you made to leave? Yeah. So. I started my career with Boca Raton Fire Rescue. I was there for five years. Uh, my wife and I, at the time we weren't married. Uh, now we've been together for 23 years, but at the time we weren't married and we both, when we first met, our first five minute conversation is we want to live in Colorado. Worked with Boca Raton Fire for five years, had an opportunity to lateral to a department in Colorado, lateral to that department. And I did 13 years there. I gave that pl that place my blood, my sweat, my tears. I, I volunteered to go out to the academy. I instructed at 10 academies. We had 10 groups go through. At the time I left, we were a 300-person department. I had instructed probably close to 200 of those, of those 300 members, uh, primarily responsible for their fitness in the morning, making sure I did it with them, number one, and then also making sure um, they were meeting the standard of the academy. And then I taught on the drill ground as well throughout the day. 
So to say I was not into the job at my department would not be the case. I was into it. I gave it everything I had. I came up with our fitness standard. I came up with our fitness assessment. Um, and at one point, man, that place turned on me. Uh, they turned on me because I taught at a conference and they believed that I was teaching at a conference and I was earning income wearing my fire department gear. And what happened was we were teaching at a conference to raise money for burn victims of military and firefighters. And is instead of them talking to the cadre, which there was five of us, one of them was at a chief level who was part of my cadre. Instead of them talking to us and asking us what we were doing, where we could have clearly explained it, this actually cost us money. This cost me a couple thousand dollars to go out there and do this. They uh, went with a full-fledged investigation. And it wasn't about what we were doing. It was about here's an opportunity to take five guys that have influence within our organization and uh, make their life a living hell. And that's what they did for 18 months. Uh, prior to that investigation, I was given the Medal of Honor two years prior. Like I definitely did my part. I dug in. I gave it everything I had. Make a long story short, the investigation was over. We appealed it. We won. But at that point, man, I felt betrayed. Mm. I felt betrayed by my organization. I felt betrayed by some of my brothers and sisters that I knew were responsible for bringing this to the attention of the administration. I felt betrayed by the administration by not doing their due diligence to kind of figure out what was really going on. Um, there was some toxic leadership in that organization at the time. And it, it was just really hard for me to be proud of my organization any longer. They were no longer meeting my standard. And as much as the fire service holds us to a standard and each fire department should hold us to a standard. And if we're being honest, if you can't meet your fire department standard, how really good are you as a firefighter? Like, our fire department standards aren't that high. Like we should be way above that, right? So that's not hard for those into the job to meet their fire department standards. What's hard nowadays is for our fire departments to meet our standard. And that's okay to have a standard for your organization. It's okay for you to say, you know what? This is no longer fitting my top three core values of what it means to work for the fire department. It's time to move on. And that's what I did. I found a fire department that met those core values and I moved on. A lot of people would say, well, you were 45 years old. You know, how did you, how did you look at going through an academy? How did you look at the risk of getting injured? Man, my faith was a big part of that. I believed if God opened those doors, he would provide the avenue and he would provide the protection for me to be successful. Now, we talked about fitness earlier. Oftentimes, we talk about fitness just as a firefighter. But when you're fit, it opens you up to all kinds of opportunities in life. You get to go play pickup basketball with your kid. You get to go on a hike with your wife. You get to go run a Tough mutter or a triathlon just because your buddy wants to do it. You don't have to train for it. And you get to go to an academy with no worries about the physical standards at 45 years old. So as far as I'm concerned, at the most basic level, fitness creates opportunities. That opportunity presented itself. I couldn't wait to get back to the basics again and like, just go I like, for me, it was like, Hey, I'm going to be at a fire conference for 16 weeks. It's basically what it is. And I went through the Academy with a smile on my face, a spirit of humility. Now, if you go back, my first fire Academy I ever went through, I was 22 years old. I was a different dude then, right? I'm going to prove to the world that I belong here. Remember we talked about mm -hmm. earlier at the most basic level, we all want to know all want to know that we have what it takes. That's all that Academy was about for me. Like you're going to know that I have what it takes. Then I go through an Academy in Colorado at 32 years old, more mature, have my first child, a little bit different guy, 45 years old. I'm a completely different guy. I have a humility about me. I've screwed up on enough calls to know that my next call could be my best call. or could be my worst call. I'm in a place of like wanting to encourage, inspire those around me through my actions, but more importantly, with the time I spend with them off to the side, if they're struggling. So it's been cool to see the evolution of who I am as, as different parts of my career at different academies. So when I went through at 45, man, it was incredible. It was one of the best experiences I've ever had. And I know there's a lot of people listening to this that might be in that place right now where they're not sure if they should stay loyal to their organization or it's time to move on. Take a quick sip of water here. Are you good? My my message to you would be: Have you done the work to try to improve your organization before you decide to move on to something else? Because oftentimes we look around and we yeah. can complain all day about the way things are, but you lose the right to complain if you're not doing the work, willing to do the work to make the change. Bottom line, 
I did that. There was, there was no doubt that I did that. I had no problem looking at myself in the mirror and be like, Hey man, your time here is up. You've done everything you can. They haven't embraced what you're doing now with fit to fight fire. If anything, they've come after it and they've attacked it. They've looked at it as a threat to their own influence. And here's one thing you'll, you'll realize, man, people in leadership or management, however you want to look at these people, people in high ranking positions that don't have influence do not like people without high ranking positions that do have influence because they thought, Hey, once I get to that chief level, my whole career, nobody's listened to me because I've never demonstrated that they should. But now I get to this chief level, they're going to listen to me and they get there and they're like, Oh wait, still nobody's listening to me. But you got this other group of guys that are into the job. They're doing it right. And why are they listening to them? Why are they going to them for advice? It's because they care about the job. It's mm. because they do, they're doing the job right. So that's what that was about. There was no doubt that's what that was about. And it wasn't going to change anytime soon. And I refuse to wake up every morning and not go to a fire department I'm proud of. Once I know I've done everything I can to you know, make, make that change. So that would be my, my, my message is if you've, if you've done the work and you've put in your time and you feel like you've done everything you can, maybe it is time to move on. But if you haven't done that, maybe it's time to do the work first and then reevaluate. That's super powerful because you, I, I was going to follow up with that question. Like you, someone that feels like they're in that spot, right? Like what, what's next? Like, how do you know that you're ready to, to move on? And, um, I think it's with anything in, in my life personally, that if I have to, if I, if I'm in any situation that, uh, affects my morals or ethics, or even like the, the personal you know mission that I have set out for myself, if anything starts to conflict that, like, it's nothing. I, I'm out. And I, I resonate with you. I, I, I eventually want to promote because I feel like that's where I can um, influence or create the most amount of change. But I would be completely OK with staying a tailboard fireman for the rest of my career. So if that means, you know, leaving at any point, you know, I, I, I'm in a very happy spot in my life. I'm surrounded by really good guys that all get it and everything like that. But if that were to ever happen to me, like I feel the exact same way. And when I've heard you talk about that, I was like, we need to highlight that because you, you've done it. It's not just talking and you, you did it the right way, in my opinion, right? Like, uh, just like you said, Jocko's whole thing, right? Like, don't just complain to complain. Have a have a, a solution to the problem that you bring to the table. So I thought that was huge. The um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, man. So that that is something that's going on in the fire service, all over the fire service right now. Um, it's when there's hypocritical leaders. Like if you think about it, like everything we stand for as a fire service is character, integrity, nobility, service, right? Those are all important pillars that hold up the fire service. Like we have the automatic trust of our community still, even in this political environment that we have and all this different stuff that's out there. When they call 911, there's a full trust given to us. When we show up, we're going to have honor, integrity, character, high level of service. It's still there. And it came on the backs of all those that have done that for 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years, they've, they've earned that for us, right? Mm -hmm. That's important to us. Anybody who connects to this job, like you and I do, and those listeners that are listening, we get that. But when we start seeing people in these positions that don't have that inside them, they're just not good people, right? They just, they're just not good human beings, right? And they create the problems within the organization and then people put them in position to try to fix the problems that they created. You can't put the person in charge of creating the problem to fix the problem. They're the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And then we see this, and then what does it do? It terrorizes the good people within the organization, internally terrorizes them because it conflicts with everything that they believe. This person should not be in that position. They don't know how to do the job. They're not connected to the mission, and they're not a good human being. And that mm -hmm. just drives us crazy. So we have to either figure out a way to change that or we have to go in a different direction. Well, I know you're speaking into a lot of people's lives right now. And the, the one thing, like, I like to play the what if game, right? A lot. And it's just like, what if, you know, our fire service leadership was the person that we want them to be? Not, not specific fire department, but the, the fire service, right? And I often ask my, my, myself the question, like, I think I, everyone is probably aware of a situation where the, the head chief or whatever, the administration in general knows that there's one person, because I feel like there's always one person that does have more influence in them. And instead of seeking out that person and, and 
like trying to figure out why they have the influence they have and asking them for assistance, it often turns cynical, you know, and they almost like villainize that person. And just like in your, just like in your scenario, right. They, they kind of put a target on your back and it drives people away. And I think the, it's such a detriment to their organization because that person obviously like they wouldn't have the target on the back if they didn't have the influence they have and they've built a following. So once they, they, the administration would turn their backs on that person, like their following sees that. Right. And that's, that's not a good way to create buy-in. No. And what, and where that comes from, usually those people that don't like, if I'm the coach of a team, I want to put the best players in positions to be successful. Right. I want the best, uh-huh. right. Those people that, see somebody who has influence as a threat or insecure. And the reason they're insecure is deep down inside, they know they have not done the work to earn the credibility that they're looking to get. They haven't done the work. They haven't earned the credibility. They know in their heart, they know that. And knowing that when they see somebody who has, it makes them even feel worse. They feel even more insecure about who they are. Secure leaders, and I'll highlight a guy right now, his name is Hunter Hackbarth. He was a chief of mine when I was out at training. Um, and with Aurora fire and I was a backseat firefighter, I was the lowest level of rank as an instructor out there. And I would come to him with ideas and he would like, that is amazing. Do the work. Let's bring this up the chain of command. And it would turn into a department wide training, right? It was a department wide training. We were doing incredible things when he was that training chief because he's secure because he earned credibility because he inspired other people throughout his career with his own actions and words. Now, if he wasn't that guy, he'd be like, no, we can't do that. It's too hard. No, that's not a good idea. No, the chief wouldn't like that. But instead, if the chief didn't like what I said, Hunter would fight for me because he knew it was a good idea and he knew it would add value to organization. So when I see a, when I see a leader who, you know, tries to put out the fire of any rank lower than them, Somebody who actually has the influence, the people go to them for advice, and I see an insecure leader. That's all I see. Yeah, I I agree, and it's a little bit introspective at the moment. So uh, <laughs> you, you you talk, I, and I know this, like we all know this about you, and you, you're a very faithful man. And uh, man, I just I would love to highlight that, not and not in any specific way, just in in general, because um, you know I I'll be a little vulnerable here, like I. I grew up in the church uh, and it wasn't very friendly to me and my family. And so I've seen a life without God in it. And, you know, it led me down certain paths and, and almost made me give up on the fire service and give up on my family and this, that, and another. And, you know, working in a, you know, fairly low income area, like we, and, and I know it's everywhere, but like you see the worst of the worst all the time. And like, it's, it, the toll takes it. And I've myself have been on, um, you know, this spiritual journey for the last couple of years, really since I've had my kids. And, um, you know, I know it plays just a huge part in you. And like immediately what I'm thinking of where I'm at in my life is you moved from Florida to Colorado, and then we're at one department for a long time, like, and left. And I know you said it was your faith that got you through that, but like, what, like, how in the world did you have the faith to make those things happen and trust that it was the right move, right? Like, I don't know if that's the right question, but that's what yeah, I'm trying to I, ask. I totally get what you're saying. I, I, I relate to what you're saying to you about your early experience with the church. I kind of experienced the same thing as a kid. And one of the things I learned over digging into the Bible and time in, in prayer is that I don't, I don't follow a church. I don't follow a pastor. I don't follow a human being. I follow Jesus Christ. Like Jesus Christ is my leader. And that, that book, the Bible, is the greatest leadership book ever written. You know, you go through Proverbs, and Proverbs just gives you lesson after lesson of how to treat people, how to handle situations. So I think where people come up short when it comes to their faith is they put their faith in people. And I put mm-hmm. my faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is my leader. And I've had so many examples over my life where he's come through for me. I'll give you a quick one, man. When I was 16 years old, I was... You, you, there's a thing called parkour. You've heard of parkour, right? Oh yeah. I was yeah. doing this when I was 16. I didn't even know what it was called. And I jumped between a three-story building and a two-story building. There was a gap. It was pretty big. I don't know what I was thinking, right? And I'm up there with my high school buddies. Dude, I didn't drink alcohol till I was 21. So anybody listening to this is like, that dude was probably drunk. Nope. <laughs> no alcohol involved. Just 
being dared to do things and nobody would do it. I'm like, I'm going to do it. I go to jump. I don't make it, dude. I jump three stories, land on a concrete slab. Mm. And the only thing I injure is my wrist. I, my, my hand is twisted around. So my palm is on the backside and my Ooh. backside's on the palm side. Up until this point, I had probably done a dozen, a dozen things like this. So my parents were tired of it. They're just like, so I made up a story of how it happened. I walked home because all my buddies ran. They thought I had died and they couldn't oh. get down into the courtyard. The courtyard was kind of sealed off. But dude, I heard, I heard a voice. I felt like somebody shook my, my body and said, wake up. And I have no idea. I can't explain it. None of my buddies were there. No one was around. Um, I had to climb up on scaffolding with a broken hand that was twisted to get out, make a lot. That's one, that's one of dozens of experiences I've had over my life where I know God was covering me. So my faith has been proven time and time again. And faith isn't faith until you test it. Everyone could say, well, I'm, I have faith. Well, faith isn't faith until you actually have to put it to the test. And I had faith that I would go from Florida to Colorado and things would work out. They did. I had faith that I'd go from one department in Colorado to another and they'd work out and they did. And there were times where I had faith in things and they didn't work out. But the best part of that was God taught me, taught me something in that trial that was even more important than the goal I had. So mm-hmm. time and time again, my belief in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior has come through in my life. And that's, that's undeniable. Like I have the Holy Spirit inside of me that has opened my eyes to th- see things that I would never see before. Any type of humility I, I have is not because of me. I am a selfish man. I am a sinner. I am somebody who makes mistakes. My ego and pride get the best of me. But when the Holy Spirit's inside of me, I'm not that person. I'm somebody who's here on earth to serve the Lord and his purpose in my life. And I believe that's what Fit to Fight Fire is. Like As much as it's a fire service page, if you look at the three stars on the logo in order, mm-hmm. it's Faith Family Fire. and God. God gave me the influence inside of Fit to Fight Fire to build this community. And part of that is making sure that people know the power of God in my life. I barely got out of high school, dude. I can't put a, in high school, if my English teacher would have, if you would have told her I would be writing stuff on social media, whatever, like put a sentence together, she would have told you, you're crazy. This guy's a moron. (laughs) But my relationship with Jesus is where my power comes from. It's not with a church. It's not with a, a church leader. It's not with some, you know, Christian guru, it's with it's with one person, it's Jesus Christ. And if more people would follow him, follow his word, they would begin to experience the Holy Spirit themselves. Because when we do put our, our faith in people, it's we're all broken, man. Every one of us is broken. We're all we all just, you know, we're all broken. Some of us just do a better job hiding it. None of us are perfect. And when people go to church, that's what they're looking for. They're like, well, you're not a perfect Christian. Yeah. No, nobody in there is. If so, if that's what you're looking for when you go there, you're gonna be disappointed. But if you could go to hear God's message, knowing that the person you should be focusing on is God and not the pastor or the person sitting next to you, the Holy Spirit will get inside of you. I promise you that. And that's that's why I have faith. That's why my faith has allowed me to do things that um, if I didn't have it, I don't know that I'd have the courage to do that. My courage comes from my relationship with Jesus Christ. That's amazing. That's amazing. I uh, Just something that I've always thought about, and it's it's a conversation that I've had, it's some of the best firemen that I know and some, and it goes deeper than that, really just some of the best firemen, some of the best instructors, some of the best mentors that, that I have in my life, they're all Christian and they all believe in Jesus Christ. And, uh, they all have a purpose and, um, they all know like why they are doing what they are doing. And and I know people in my life that, that, that don't, that don't know Jesus and not saying that they're poor firemen or anything like that, but I just some oftentimes think like how much more their life would benefit if, if they did have a relationship. And I think that says, says the same thing about you, right? Like um, you have a calling to share the message through fit to fight fire. I have a friend, same thing. He believes that his calling is to teach and he's one of the best instructors that I know. Right. And it's just this common theme over and over again to the point where it's undeniable. It's super undeniable. Not to mention that uh, I always like to hear uh, like fire service stories and, I was kind of telling you about one that that we had not too long ago before this uh, podcast. And we, we circled back to, uh, it it was just something that was such a big call that we dissected every part of it. Right. And I know other people do this, but like at the end of the day, like we just can't think of anything other than, than, than divine intervention. Right. Like, and it's a theme, it's a theme. I hear, when I hear people's stories, I'm like, 
one hundred percent. That's that's what was going on in that. And so, like, I'm curious. Do you have any stories like that where, like, no, no, uh, no denying that that that, that God was at work? Yeah, man. So in 2012, we had the um, we had the Aurora Theater shooting, okay. where he went in there and he shot 70, 70 people. And I was on Engine Eight. We were the first ones on scene. Literally, our station was um, like one point five miles away. That's how close wow. we were. Um, and prior to that, I was on two SWAT teams as a medic. I was on a SWAT team in South Florida with Boca Raton Fire as a medic, and I was also on Aurora's SWAT team as a medic. So. Uh, that's 2012. Like the active shooter thing wasn't super, you know, it wasn't a lot. There wasn't a lot about other than like what happened at Columbine and some stuff that they pieced together. There wasn't a lot of training out there, but for right. me, I had had probably between those two teams that I had been on, I probably had 12 active shooter training. So God put me on that call. Right. So like I'm on that call. I'm not on the team at the time, but I have that training. And we get on the call and it's complete chaos, man. We got dispatched to a single shooting. I was at station eight and uh, sleeping in my bunk. The call we had before that was nothing uh, critical. Uh, we get up, there's four of us in the engine. The two riding backwards are fire medics. We didn't do our own transport in Aurora. So the, the transport was separate, but the call before that was so insignificant. I looked at my partner, Dan, and I'm like, Hey, are you up on this call? Or am I up? Like who's running this call? We're going to a shooting, single shooting, not a big deal in our city. Who's up? Because if Dan's up on it, he's running the call. I'm going to be the skills guy. I'm going to make Dan's job easy. He's like, no, Johnny, you you ran the last call. I'm up on this call. One person, that's all we're going to. Well, as we're driving, you know, clear in the bay, making our way, we start hearing two, three, four. By the time we get there, man, we pull up and it looks like Times Square, like on a Saturday night. And we have just chaos and people running toward, and we're the first fire apparatus on scene. The reason I set that up is, I have all this training. I have, you know, a mindset that I feel like was in line with how to handle that call. But man, as I was walking down this, the, the theater, I was walking down the Bravo side of the theater. I was reciting Bible verses, dude, in my head. Uh, like, I'm like, I could do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. People mistake that sometimes. It's like, well, if I, if I believe in Jesus, I'm, we're going to win the Super Bowl or you know, I'm, right. that's also, I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me when things aren't going my way. It's also, cause that's where Paul was. Paul was in prison and he was like, I'm content with suffering. I'm content with riches. I'm content with having nothing. I'm content with having everything. So as I'm walking down the side of that, that Bravo side, like we don't have what we need. Like I, I recognize it right away. Like ambulances can't get in. Police cars have all access cut off. We have 70 victims. We didn't know that at the time. I worked up, I walked up to a casualty collection point that was like organically formed. And we had like six reds right off the bat. I'm by myself. That never happens. We usually don't work by ourselves, but we had to because of how spread out the scene was. And what am I doing? I'm thinking about God. And I'm thinking about the power of Jesus in my life in a moment where this is my Super Bowl, right? This is my, and I didn't have what I needed. We had one guy whose leg was blown off and it was being held on by some skin. And a little bit of his veins were still connected and there was blood shooting out of his leg. There was a nurse from your state, Texas, who was on vacation, who happened to have her elbow buried into his femoral artery to stop the bleeding. And every time she would talk to me to try to give me a report, just shifting her body, the blood would start squirting out of this guy's leg. So I, wow. I right. I, we had one tourniquet. Think about where we're at now as a fire service. We had one tourniquet on our fire engine. My buddy Dan had that at a different casualty collection point, but I was thinking about Jesus. I was thinking about like, John, you could get through this. You've gotten through tough things before. God is on your side. Keep working through the resistance. Keep trying to figure out a plan. And that's where we came up with transporting patients and police vehicles, which was never, we like, you would never do that, but they needed a surgeon. Hmm. They did not need a medic. So to get, to kind of answer your question, man, that whole scene for me personally and everything, every, every aspect of that call is going to be different for everybody who was there. But for me, it was a faith-based call, man, that my faith allowed me to kind of see things in a way that I knew no matter how difficult it was and how challenging it was, I was good. I was going to be fine. And more importantly, after that call where there, a lot of people have experienced some post-traumatic stress, mm. I believe I've experienced post-traumatic growth. And the difference is, is that that situation has made me a stronger person. It gave me an opportunity to test my faith. 
because faith isn't faith unless you test it. It gave me an opportunity to see the love of God, how in such a chaotic position, in such a chaotic situation, people that were in the theater were helping other people, pulling them out of the theater, like in tragedy, to see so much hope and so much love. Man, I don't know how anyone does this. This is just my personal experience. Like how anybody does this job without having some sort of faith in their life. I just, I don't know how it's possible, but that, that call definitely highlighted for me um, how, how God's played a, a significant role in my life. Sure. I, I did not know that you were, you were at that. Uh, I've listened to several podcasts. I, I've never heard that story before. That's, that's incredible. I mean, and how many, how many people ended up being shot there? There were 70, and I think we transported, the majority of, of patients got transported by PD vehicle. Wow. It was like a 50-50 split between PD vehicles and um, ambulances. Okay. But just to kind of go back to it, that night, our whole city, we had eight ambulances for the entire city. So I tell people, like some people, like you should have never used police cars. That was terrible. Even if you would have put all eight ambulances, which they weren't all available, some of them were on calls. Even if you would have put all eight in the parking lot, opened the back doors, had the pram out, and you put three reds in each one, which uh-huh. probably can't do, that's 24 patients. We had 60 that were still viable. Like, wow. it didn't matter. Like, we were, it, we were up against it from the get. So looking back on that, man, just all things through Christ who strengthens me. Everyone knows that's an important Bible verse for me, Philippians 4.13. It is not about like, hey, I got this goal in life. And as long as I believe in Jesus, it's going to work out. That's not what this is about. It's about no matter how difficult your situation is, you're good because you have Jesus Christ. And he will never, never leave you or forsake you. And although what you're going through may not be ideal and it may be painful, you're going to see the purpose in that pain at some point in your life. And you're going to give that pain purpose by sharing it with other people and showing them, hey, this is the power of God in my life. That's all it is. We're not, I'm not trying to like, when I share about God, man, I'm not trying to convert you to, a, to, to believe in Jesus. I just have a responsibility to share what he's done for me. That's it. The rest is up to God and the Holy Spirit. I'm not a converter. That's Jesus Christ does that. Really? I'm a messenger who shares the power of him in my life. And if that resonates with you, awesome. If not, I hope you still like me. Because if, if you're not a believer, I still like you. Like that does yeah. not determine whether or not we're bros. What really? determines whether or not we're bros is whether you're a good person or not. And typically those that follow Jesus are. Now you may follow the church, you may follow a human and get off track. But if you're truly following Jesus, he's going he's gonna to show you the way and put that Holy Spirit inside you. If anybody listening to this, like if you don't take anything away from this conversation, like rewind the last five minutes. And I think that's enough because something you keep saying just keeps sticking out. Like faith isn't faith unless it's tested. I know several people that, that need to hear that and, and it'll definitely resonate with them as long as they listen to this. Hopefully they will. Cause they're my bros, right? Yeah, uh, buddy. That's that, that was one of the, yeah, that was powerful, man. I, I did not know you were there. And then just the way you worked through it. And then, like you said, you, uh, the post incident growth, like that was huge because I know several people that have gone through traumatic incidents, right. And, uh, some, some that are faithful and some that aren't. And, it seems like the people that are like they tend to deal with not saying that they don't struggle. I'm not saying yeah, that we all, at all. We all do. I think about that call. I think about that call. I used to think about it every day. It's not every day anymore, which is kind of nice, but I think about it when I thought about it every day, I tell people, I think about it every day in the best possible way. And what does that mm-hmm. mean? I want it to be there. Like I, I was supposed to be on vacation and I didn't go on vacation. If all my brothers would have been there and I wasn't there, I would have felt, I would have been disappointed. I don't want to see bad things happen. But I do want to, I do want to measure myself. I want to test myself. Anybody who's doing this job for the right reason wants those opportunities to measure themselves and test themselves. But I I, I will, I will say this, the whole post-traumatic growth thing comes from believing that God is ultimately in control of all things. There is nothing that happens in this world that doesn't have a purpose for the greater good. Even the horrible things we see, that is hard to swallow for some people because they'll say, if God was in control, why would they let children go through this? If God was in control, why would they let you know, this couple go through that? You don't know what God is up to. You have no idea how that circumstance is going to affect somebody 5, 10, 15 years down the road to ultimately fulfill God's plan, to draw others closer to him. So when you say you look at people who have faith and those who don't, the ones that have faith tend to deal with things better. I'd have to imagine it's because deep down inside, they know God's in control of all things and does all things for the good. Even though there's difficulty in that and it's hard, like people lose children, 
there, there's tough stuff that happens, but ultimately there's going to be a good for the purpose of God that comes out of that. And that's just how I see things. And that's how I approach the job. I love, I love the way you just explained it because it's so much, it, it rings true for me. So like, I relate to everything you just said, because I've had those questions and I've talked with, uh, uh, you know, my, my mentors through the fire service that just so happened to be some of my, my mentors, uh, through my spiritual walk as well. And, uh, once again, just because they're good people. Right. Um, but the, the, the overall theme, if you will, that, that I always take away from it is just like that whenever we are exposed to these, cause we do as, as, as firemen and paramedics, like we're exposed to traumatic incidents, uh, way more often than the normal, uh, civilian, you know, person. And, uh, you said like, you can't imagine how someone lives without having, you know, Jesus in those moments. And it's not pretty. I can tell you that I could live through that. Like it, it affects a lot of stuff and, you know, there's healthy ways to deal with it. And I would just encourage people to find that, you know, whatever that is for you, because uh, like I said, I, I've dealt with it and it's, it's not fun and it's a lot better, you know, on the other side of things, if that makes sense. So, um, John, I really appreciate you coming on, on the podcast, man. I think we just crossed over the one hour mark. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Anything people need to know? No, man, it's, uh, it's nice to talk about faith. I think a lot of people have a hard time talking about that in the fire service, especially at a firehouse. And my encouragement to you is like, don't be afraid to share your faith. Be afraid not to. And what mm. I mean by that is like, you might have, you might unlock something inside somebody just based on your story and how God has positively impacted your life. Now, don't hit somebody over the head with a with a with a Bible. Like well, that's not what I'm talking about. Like when you have when you have relationships and you have trust, like it is your if God is working in your life and you could look to that as the reason that you're alive today, it's the reason why you didn't take your life, or it's the reason why you stayed married, or it's the reason why you didn't lose your patience with your kids. Right. Or it's the reason why you decided to take the job more serious is you just you, you felt God calling you to be a better, a better firefighter, whatever that is. You have a responsibility to share that. That's the reason why don't hide that. You know, don't be afraid of what people are going to think. They're going to think what they're going to think. That's all. That's the only other thing I'd want to share is don't be afraid to share your faith. Be afraid not to. Mm, that's good. I, uh, if if anyone wants to get a hold of you, uh, any upcoming classes, um, if you is there's anything else you want to highlight, like just about what Fit to Fight Fire's got going on, uh, like we mentioned earlier, the Patreon app, um, it, and then like I said, if you're going to be at any conferences, classes, anything coming up here pretty quick. Yeah, so the only thing I'll be attending that is scheduled right now is I'll be at the the um, firemanship conference conference in Aurora, Illinois. We'll be doing that live podcast. We have. Uh, three amazing guests. These are previous podcasts that we did, but we're going to do them live and they're all faith-based. That's mm -hmm. what the podcast has transitioned to is faith-based. And that's what I've been called to do. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, Brian Abbott, he's a firefighter who um, <laughs> tried to hang himself from a door prop that he actually built in his garage. Think about that. He's building a door prop that's going to train firefighters to save lives. And he was in such a dark place that he tried to hang himself from that door prop. And he heard a voice inside of his garage nobody else was in there that said stand up so that was that episode is called stand up we're gonna have robert wind who was in prison got stabbed seven times there's no reason why this guy should be a firefighter and in solitary they put him in solitary to protect him from the gang that stabbed him uh he heard god's voice and we're also going to talk to uh josh chase and if you you've had josh on your on your podcast as well just an incredible story of loss, redemption, and digging deeper into his faith. So we're going to do that at the Firemanship Conference. Those three episodes will be live. And then I'll also be teaching with Rick George in Tactical Resiliency. We'll be teaching that class, uh, Developing High Performance. So other than that, man, that's the only only place I'm going to be. I try to minimize my time away from my family, um, you know, as much as I can. And uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me, the easiest way to do it is to... Uh, Go on one of those social media platforms, either Instagram or Facebook, look up Fit to Fight Fire, or you could uh, email me at john.ftff at gmail.com. I'd be more than happy to help you out any way I can. 
or just have a conversation in general. Cause that's a, like I said, that's my favorite part of the Patreon is just yeah. getting an opportunity to talk to people. Cause we're all the same deep down inside. We might have a different nozzle that we want to use, or we might have a different, you know, a uh, go-to tool that we carry. But at the end of the day, if you're in this job for the right reason, we're all the same. We're all trying to do the best we can with what we have. And uh, when you talk to more people, you realize that, and it's just a good thing to do. Well, John, like I said, I'm very honored to have you on the podcast. I, I can't tell you what it means to me. And I know the, the fire service reflects this as well, just how much uh, influence and, and really just things that you have done for the fire service through fit to fight fire and through your stuff personally, uh, your story's inspiring and everything like that. Like, it just means a lot for me to, for you to come on here. Thanks for taking time out of your day. Um, if you just hang on just a second, I'll sign this off and then I'll get right back to you. Well, that's been Tailboard Misfits podcast with John Spera. Uh, guys, we're going to be um, at a fire conference coming up here pretty soon in Grapevine, Texas. Uh, just helping out with that. Come and uh, check it out. I think we still have a couple of openings on it. Uh, other than that, make sure you head over to tailboardmisfits.com uh, to get some merch and uh, stickers. Uh, and just to support the podcast. We appreciate you listening.